Uh, welcome everybody to the second session of the morning. Uh, it's Anish Kamar, uh, bringing us rewriting MMU for fun and profit. Uh, Anish is from IBM and uh, is looking forward to entertaining your brains. If you could welcome him, please. Okay, uh, thank you all for coming to this session. Um, in this talk, what we are going to do is to look at uh, uh, IBM Power processor architecture and the changes we have to do in the Linux kernel memory management subsystem uh, to support new generation of power architecture. Uh, uh, I work for IBM, a Linux technology center, and uh, I come from India. Uh, so to get started, uh, the outline is kind of like I want to start with an introduction of IBM power architecture, like kind of a given overview of the evolution of uh, power processor and what we did in the few generation of power processor that we have. And then we kind of delve into the details of Power 8, which is one of the, which is the current power processor generation and its memory management unit, the complexities associated with supporting that in Linux kernel. Then we go on to look at Power 9, which is the upcoming power architecture, and then challenges in supporting that in Linux kernel and how we have to change Linux kernel subsystem, memory management subsystem to have a uh, you know performing backward compatible implementation. So to give an idea about power power architecture, uh, the power um, the power architecture actually got introduced in the early 1990s with RISC system 600. Uh, the power actually stands for performance optimization with enhanced risk. Shortly after that, IBM started working with Motorola and Apple to do a more cost-effective PowerPC chips, which ended up in IBM releasing PowerPC 601 for 600 model 25. So the PC there stands for performance computing. This was followed by the release of Power 3. As you can see, like each release or each generation of power processor kind of had some you know, industry-leading features. If you look at Power 3, that's the first 64-bit enterprise architecture. Now, for the next generation of Power 4, it became the first 64-bit processor to cross one gigahertz clock. It actually introduced dual core, and it had some kind of hypervisor support, not a full-fledged hypervisor, but we had some kind of hypervisor support. Power 5 introduced the uh, a full implementation of hypervisor. At that point, you know, IBM also kind of uh, made it such that you know you your operating systems always run in the virtualized mode, which basically indicate operating systems runs as a guest. So your ability to run uh, operating systems on directly on the hardware, which we generally indicate as bare metal, got limited at power power five time. It actually introduced symmetric multithreading. Power 6, again, a very high frequency processor. I think we hit there 4 gigahertz. It was a big thing at that point of time. Power 7 kind of introduced balanced multicore, and then it, it also started introducing the concept of accelerators, uh, you, know, uh, you know, things which we can accelerate off core. Um, in Power 8, we started introducing something called coherent process, accelerated processor interface, which is CAPI, which is like, you know, uh, you know kind of working around the Moore's law limitations and then trying to see how we can actually improve the application performance using accelerators which has coherent access to the memory. Power8 also saw us opening up the hardware completely uh, in the form of open source hardware design, open source firmware, end-to-end -end open source under the open power umbrella. And we have Power9 coming up soon. Yeah, now looking at power architecture, um, you know, this talk is going to be memory management, and we just want to delve into the architecture uh, with memory management as the focus. So there are two types of you know, uh, CPUs under the power umbrella. Like we, we can classify them as desktop servers and then the embedded CPUs. Uh, we will be looking at desktop and server CPUs in this session and not looking at challenges with respect to embedded CPUs. That's, that's completely you know, uh, a different talk altogether. So in, in the desktop and server CPU's case, what we essentially have with respect to the memory management subsystem or the translation model is um, we actually have a hashed page table structure. Uh, 
Um, what that essentially means is that, uh, uh, so, so before, we, before we get started into understanding uh, what's the hash page table structure, I, I want to introduce two terms here, like you know, the one that I actually listed towards the end, uh, which is called effective address and virtual address. Uh, they, are, they are slightly different from what we know from computer literature. Uh, for example, power kind of refer to an address range returned by the operating system by MAP or by BRK or whatever malloc or thing as effective address. And virtual address is something that the architecture internally use for translation from that effective to real. I'll kind of explain you in detail what a virtual address is, uh, you know, but, but just keep in mind that what we are familiar with the address that returned by the operating system is actually referred to as effective address. And you will see that referred to as effective address throughout the slides, and virtual address is something different. Now, what, what we essentially have in, in a, desktop or a, C, a desktop or a server CPU is the effective address being converted into a hash value by kind of using a hash page table structure. And uh, we use the hash page hash value to actually look up the real address. Uh, you know, the hash table is consulted to actually look up the real address. So uh, one of the interesting aspect about the, the MMU subsystem with respect to the desktop, uh, the server CPUs is there is one hash page table for the entire kernel and the application included. So this is remarkably different from the memory management model that you that you are familiar with on other architectures, where you know you would have multiple page tables per application and things like that. But with respect to the power architecture, what we essentially have is one page table covering the entire application and the kernel. And how we essentially actually map a, a process effective address into that, you know, one page table is by using a mechanism of segmentation. What we essentially do is we have this 64-bit effective address space which get divided into different segments and we map that segments into a virtual address space. And the virtual address space is actually a 78-bit address space. So we have applications running in, with 64-bit address space, which get mapped into a 78-bit virtual address space. I will explain in detail, you know, with a picture how we actually do that. But you know, the the process effective address is translated to virtual address using a segment mechanism. So effective address space gets sliced into segments, and these segments get mapped into the virtual address space, and that's how we actually get from effective to real. So that's 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 it's a very simple overview of uh, you know uh, power architecture. Now on the embedded CPU sites, what we essentially have is a software loaded TLB. What that basically means is that uh, uh, you know you will get a TLB means which will be handled by the operating system, and they there are multiple variants of embedded power PC chips, and they have different types of page table formats, and you know the kernel need to handle them. And most of the cases, we build a particular variant. We don't do a generic kernel which run on all of them. Now, to get into details of Power8 MMU, as I explained before, uh, Power Architecture used a hash page table structure. Um, Power8 essentially supports different page table size. Um, we do support uh, 4K, 64K, both of them at the, you know, the, the, the at the size of the page table that the hardware can recognize. Then there are huge page size like 16 MB and 16 GB. Um, as I said, like the effective address space is divided into segments. There are different segment size that we actually support, uh, 256 MB and one terabyte segments. Uh, we, we do support multiple page sizes per segment. What that essentially means is that the segments get further divided into pages, and I can have a segment with pages of 4K and 64K. There is this implication of what that means, uh, which I will, which I will explain in later slides. Now, the interesting thing we need to understand is for for the Linux kernel. Um, you know, if you look at Linux kernel, uh, Linux kernel kind of implement most of the subsystems in an arc neutral manner. What that basically means is that a large part of Linux kernel deals with a, 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 an, a, an abstracted MMU model which involve multiple level of page table. So if you go, if you look at the MM code, what you basically see is, you know, um, uh, the expectation from the core MMU, which basically says, I expect a PMD, a PGD, or a PTE sort of thing. Like, you know, the core MMU always deals with multiple levels of page table. It is the responsibility of the architecture which implements 
the, the memory management subsystem to map that Linux model of MMU to what the hardware does. So in case of Power8, what it essentially means is that we actually started off uh, with a three-level Linux page table. So when I said Linux kernel core MMU kind of expects a multi-level page table, it, it also gives the flexibility on the implementation to choose how many levels of page table that we need. It depends on the address space that the architecture supports. So Power8 had a three-level page table on the core side, which is the generic Linux kernel side. And uh, so we will see, if, if you want to manage a page table entry, we will see the Linux core, core MMU walking a PGD, a PMD, and a PTE to actually set a page table entry read-only or read-write. Now, what, what, what is the responsibility of the architecture implementation is to map this MMU model into the hardware, into the model that the hardware expects, and in case of Power8, it's the hash page table. Now, this is very tricky because we now, need, we now have two page tables, one, the Linux core MMU expects, and the other, the, the hardware expects, which is the hash page table structure, and we need to make sure that both of them are kept in sync. And when I say that, uh, you know, you definitely don't want a page table entry that is marked as read-only in the Linux view, but marked as read-write in the hardware view, right? Because that, that basically means that you know, if somebody tries to modify the page, you will not get to know. But the other way is perfectly fine, which basically means that you can have a page which is marked as read-write in the Linux view, but marked as read-only in the hardware view, which is the hardware page table. So one of the big challenge with having two page tables which need to be kept in sync is that we now have complex PTE update rules, which basically says that when you are updating this, hold that lock, make sure nobody is doing a parallel update, none of the Linux subsystem is going to update it in a conflicting manner and things like that. So to give a pictorial view of what Power8 MMU does, what we, have, what we essentially have is an effective address. Um, as I explained before, it's a 64-bit effective address, which the, the kernel returns as a return address of a MAP syscall or a BRK syscall. And then we use that effective address to look up uh, a segment table. As I said, like an effective address is divided into different segments. So we need to find out which segment this effective address is looking for. From the segment table, we will know the virtual segment, uh, the, the, the 78 virtual address space where this segment got mapped. And then we have a TLB which kind of tell us that whether that virtual address is, you know, mapped to a real address, so we can actually look up the translation, look up buffer to see whether the translation is already cached. If you don't find in the TLB, we go and do a hash page table lookup. Uh, this is what it is. So what we essentially have is a 64-bit effective address. So ESID is effective segment ID, and the page and the byte are like, you know, the other offsets within that segment. Now what we, what we do is that we take that effective segment ID and then look up into something called a segment table, which essentially have like a effective segment ID and a virtual segment ID. So you know, there will be one entry of effective segment ID and there will be another virtual segment ID. We pick that virtual segment ID, the page and the byte, and build something called a 78-bit virtual address. It's, it's, it's very simple. Now that segment table is one per process. So you know when you contact switch an application in and out, we will flush that segment table and pull one specific to that process. So if a process uses an address X, we go and find the segment uh, effective segment ID for that S, look up in the segment table, get the virtual segment identifier for that X segment, and put and build a 78-bit uh, uh, virtual address. So this is part of the problem. Once I have a 78-bit virtual address, I can go and look into the TLB if there is a translation cache already. If I don't have that, what happens? So here is what happens. Now we have a 78-bit virtual address. <coughs> now we can actually look at this 78-bit virtual address as a virtual page number followed by the offset in that you know, virtual page. Now what we actually have is a hash page table, uh, you know, I said there is one hash page table for the entire, you know, for the entire uh, guest, which include kernel and the application. So the the address, the, the address pointing the base of the hash page table is uh, basically placed in a register called SDR1, 
Um, so SDR1 is actually a register which contains the base of the hash page table address. So as you can see, it actually gives us a base of the hash page table address, and there is this full hash page table. And there are like multiple slots. Like so, you know, with each hash value, I will get like eight buckets. So PT0 to PT7 is actually the buckets. Now what we essentially do is that I take that virtual page number, pass it through a hashing function, uh, which is hardware defined, and I get a hash value which will actually point me to one of that hash group. Each group has eight buckets, but once I get that virtual page number, I get a hash value which will point me to the group. Once I, have, once I know which group I am you know, pointing to, I go and search in that eight buckets, matching the virtual page number, and hence I got something called a slot. So we find a slot in that hash. Uh, now that slot contains two information. One is the virtual page number, and another is the real page number. So I take the real page number out of that, take the byte out of that, and I get the final real address for the, for the dereferencing effective address. So this is how a Power8 MMU works. Now, the interesting, interesting thing here is that, as I said, from the virtual page number or the virtual address, what I get is actually a hash value, which doesn't give me the exact slot details. It gives me the group details. And then I need to do a comparison, eight comparison, right, to actually find the slot. Now, if you look at uh, you know, different uh, you know, PT operations, like you know, updating my production bits, converting a PT entry to read only, or invalidating a PT entry, uh, you know, so as I said, like you know, most of the most of the operating systems are run as a guest, and hence we have this standard called PAPR, which is basically an hypercall, standardized hypercall, which allows the hypervisor to you know modify the page table, primarily because the page table is owned by the hypervisor. So if you look at a uh, uh, few of the hypervisor call like HRemove and HProduct, they expect you to provide the exact slot number. So what what I essentially mean is that they expect you to provide that that slot not the hash group value. They expect you to provide the exact slot which actually contain the mapping of virtual page number to real page number. What that essentially means is that to use those hypercalls, I need to keep track of the slot number. Because from the virtual address, I get the hash value. That's not sufficient. I also need to know the exact slot which contain the mapping of virtual address to real address. So what that essentially means, uh, so you know, one of, this is one of the interesting challenge with respect to you know, Power8 MMU, because we are forced to track the slot details. Now, where do I, slot, where do I track this slot, slot information with respect to each page table entry? The easiest place to track the slot is Linux page table entry. So what we essentially did is when we actually you know, create a Linux page table entry, we took the slot details and put them in the uh, you know, Linux page table, table entry, because primarily for us, Linux page table is a software entity. It's not a hardware entity, right? As I said, the core MMU has a view of Linux, the Linux core MMU has a view of, you know, has a generic memory management model. It expects a multi-level page table, and we are free to define our own, right? So we actually, Linux actually tracked the slot as a part of page table entry. Now there is actually an interesting um, you know, problem with respect to Power8 hardware. Uh, Power8 actually supports hardware, even though I said like you know, uh, Power Architecture do support multiple page, page sizes, there are few Power Architectures, older generations, that only supports 4K hardware page table. So if, 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 you, if, you, if you look at Linux support on Power Architecture, our page size is 64K. Uh, that's slightly different from what Intel does. Intel actually does a 4K, but Power Architecture kind of defaults to 64K page size. So what I essentially said here is actually like you know for one entry for 64K, right? So you know you take a page fault per page. You, when you when you actually derefer, your page faults are per page, so you get a page faults per 64K, and hence like you know you have one slot for 64K. But we do have, you know, a uh, few older generations hardware which only does 4K hardware uh, page table. So how do you do a 64K Linux page on a 4K hard on a hardware which supports only 4K size? What we essentially do is we map 16 4K for a 64K Linux page. 
right? So that's the simplest way of doing. But we do have a challenge there because Linux actually want you to take uh, you know, one page table entry for 64K, but on the hardware side, we have now 16 slot entries. As I said, uh, if you go back and look here, what we essentially have is one entry per hardware page. So when you say our hardware supports 4K and my Linux kernel supports 64K, I would have 16 entries here for my one Linux page. And that means we need to now start tracking 16 slot details. Now, as I said before, a Linux page table is actually a software entity, so I, we decided to stash everything into a Linux page table. So if you look at Linux page table uh, format for Power Architecture, it's a very cramped page table entry. We need to track quite a lot of information in the Linux page table. Uh, so what we essentially do, like, you know, uh, for tracking slot details, we need, like, you know, we need to find out which of those. So we need three bits. We don't have that many bits on a 64-bit entity. So what we essentially do is the slot number is actually tracked in, a, in, a, in an extension to the page table, but whether we are already faulted in a slot or not, whether the slot is valid is tracked in the Linux page table, that means <coughs> Sorry. That means we track 16 bits, which is 16 4K pages, right? We, we, we steal 16 bits out of the Linux page table to track that. Now, the reason why I want to talk about all these things is to understand, to, to let you, uh, to help you understand that the Linux page table format used by Power Architecture is a completely software-defined entity, which is cramped with quite a lot of information needed to support this different type of hardware architectures. Right now, now comes the next generation power processor, which is Power Nine. This is very interesting in, th in that Power Nine actually supports two translation mode in the same processor. So this is actually a processor that can actually do address translation in a two completely different way. Now, what it actually does is it do support hash page table structure, uh, which is the thing that I explained till now. But it also supports a new mode of Radix page table structure. <coughs> now, Radix page table structure is a multi-level page table. I have a diagram which kind of explains it in detail later. But you also need to understand different page, page sizes uh, uh, supported by Radix page table. So with, with Power NAN, with Radix translation mode, we support 4K, 64K, which is same as the page size supported by Power 8. But our huge page size is slightly different. We have 2 MB and 1 GB. Whereas with Power 8, we have 16 MB and 16 GB. <clears throat> so this, I'm introducing this to give you an idea about the challenges that we have in implementing this in Linux kernel. We also give the ability, to, ability for the guests to manage translation buffers. As I, as I explained before, in case of hash structure, what we have is one hash page table for the entire application and the kernel. And that hash page table <coughs> is primarily managed by the hypervisor. In case of Power NAND, we give the guest the ability to manage the translation. That means guests do have translation caches and guests do have the ability to invalidate the translations. Now, one of the interesting things that we did is <clears throat> we tried to design this in such a way that the hardware table structure can map very easily with the core Linux MMU page table structure. As I explained before, core MMU kind of use a multi-level page structure, and Power9 MMU in the Radix translation mode also uses a uh, multi-level page table structure. One interesting limitation we have here is since this is a page table walked by the hardware, the, the format is defined by the hardware, and it is a big Indian format. Whereas if you look at Power 8, the, form, the page table structure, the Linux page table structure is a software entity. We can define what we want, and hence we have, dis chosen to dis to, we have decided to use a CPU native format for the Linux page table structure. Whereas in case of Power 9, because the page table structure is walked by the CPU, it is defined by the hardware, and hence it is a big Indian format. Now here is 
what what Power9 MMU, uh, what we do in Power9, what we effectively have here is also an effective address, which is actually a 64-bit address. Depending on the translation mode you configure your processor in, it can actually do a hash translation mode or a radix translation mode. If it is in hash translation mode, we fairly do the same thing that we did with Power8. We do a segment lookup, then we do a <coughs> then we do a TLB lookup. <coughs> if you if you don't find the translation cached in TLB, we do a page table lookup, and then we get a real address. On the radix side, what we essentially have is the effective address is first looked up in a uh, uh, process scoped page table. I, I'll kind of explain what is process scoped and partition scoped in the, in the following slides. Once you look up in the process scoped page table, what we essentially get is a guest real address, which again get looked up in a partition scoped page table to actually get to the real address. Now, here is what we have. What we essentially have is actually 64 bit, you know, 64 bit effective address. So, as seen before, what we actually have is an effective page number and a byte. Uh, now, we actually introduce a new register there called PTCR, Partition Table Control Register. What it actually contains is a pointer to a partition table. So, what is actually a partition table? It is actually, you know, 128 bit entry for every guest. So, every partition that you run. And it actually contains a pointer to base of process table. So the, so, the first 64 bit points to the process table, the second 64 bit points to the partition scoped translation. For this discussion, let us ignore the partition scoped translation because it, it kind of makes it the entire thing pretty confusing. So, let us look at only the process scope table. So, what we essentially have is actually an address pointing to process table, which is actually completely managed by the guest, right? Now, so what, what, what is the index into that partition table is actually your partition ID. It actually gives you a number which indicate which guest operating system are you are running. So if you say like my partition ID 10, it actually offset into 10 and get you the process table for that partition. Now, what is the index into the process table is the process ID of the application, right? This is not the Linux process ID. This is an MMU context ID that we actually generate within the kernel, but it's actually a number which represent an application. Now, with that base, what we essentially get is a base of the first level of the table. So, that address actually gives you the base of the first level of multi-level page table, and we call that as PGD, which is essentially the Linux terminology. If you're familiar with the Linux core MMU, PGD is the top level table, that's the level one table. Now, what we actually do is that 64-bit effective address is split into multiple chunks. We actually split them into four chunks. So, the first piece is taken as an index into the PGD, and there you get the base of the next level table. So, if you, if you are aware of the Intel architecture or any of the computer science, you know, MME model, from here onwards, it is, it's more or less the same, right? You know, you have the address which gets split into different chunks, and you use that chunks as an index into the different table. So, you take the next chunk, it will give you the offset into the PUD, then you take the next chunk, it will give the offset into the PMD, and you get the next chunk, it will give the offset into the PTE, at which point you actually find the real address. Right, so real page number and the byte. This is this is fairly simple. The only thing you need to understand is the base of the PGD gets picked up from the process table, which get picked up from the partition table, and the base of that in turn get picked up from the partition table control register. So this is essentially the Radix MMU model. Now, what is the challenge? So as I explained, <coughs> so this is the two MMU model the the, the power architecture supports. <coughs> now, what challenge do we have? Now, if you look at the distro kernels, right, uh, I mean, they're not going to ship two different kernels for two different, you know, um, uh, power architectures, right? I mean, you basically want, you, and it's very difficult to figure out. You, you cannot say that, okay, let us start the computer in, like, hash model, so the installer kernel, let it be hash. Then we will fig ask the user which model do you want to run, and based on that, I will install a kernel which is suited for that model. That, that, that doesn't work. So what we essentially were forced upon was to come up with a solution which will dynamically figure out the model supported and choose the right MMU abstractions in the architecture without having large performance impact. Now, what that essentially means is that if I'm running my a, a, a relatively new kernel, if I'm running on a power eight, it should use the hash MME model. And if I'm going to run it on power nine, it, would, it should kind of use the Radix MME model, right? So the memory management code should be able to detect the translation mode and should be able to work with both the translation mode and 
interestingly mmu have quite a lot of fast path so we can't do like you know if you are power 9 let us do this or if you are power 8 let us do this sort of thing because the conditional thing kind of comes on the way of any fast path so here is what we are the challenge is to actually support these two model in a single kernel which is you know in, in a very performance effective way and without having large complexity introduced in the code path so let us look at the first thing that 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 we have to tackle right as i said uh, uh, you know one of the reason why i introduced all those slot, slot tracking and then 4k page size is to actually talk about this uh, you can't do any of that now because we we, we, we can only have one page table format which the core MMU Linux memory model, Linux core MMU deals with. So we simply cannot track a lot of slot informations and other details in Linux page table because uh, in case of Power9, that page table entry is defined by hardware and hence you don't have that many free software bits. Right? So if you say a page table entry is defined by hardware, what we essentially have is a lot of hardware defined bits and they will leave some like you know four or five bits for you to use as a software. Now that four or five bits is not enough for you to track all those information I talked about, the slot details, the valid slot details and things like that. So the, one of the first thing that we actually did is to actually rework the entire power rate slot tracking in such a way that we can free up quite a lot of PTA bits. So the first thing we had to do was to actually bring the Linux page table structure in line with what is expected on Power9. This actually in, in involved quite a lot of reworking of the code. We kind of cleaned up the entire code. So as you can see, this is what we end up with now. So we have like these headers like hash is 64, hash 4K, then we have pay 4K page table, 64K page table, then we have Radix 4K, Radix 62. So all these combinations uh, are nicely isolated in different headers now. So this is this is what one of the primary challenge with respect to page table, and we kind of solved it by moving around bits, freeing, uh, d you know, changing the way we kind of track the slot and things like that. The second part of the thing is that as if you see the diagram before, uh, uh, you know, uh, this guy actually uses four level page table. And if you see, if, if you remember what I explained before for power eight, it uses three level page table. So it, that's not going to work. You switching the level of page table dynamically is extremely complex uh, to do in, 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 the, in the fast path. So what we essentially did is we kind of switched we kind of switched power eight to a four level page table that means we reworked our page table allocation routines you know we reworked our huge table allocation routines and things like that uh, so uh, you know uh, uh, yeah so basically we kind of reworked the size of all these page tables in such a way that it can work with both uh, power eight and power nine the interesting thing for you to notice is that even though we reworked the size, we can't keep the size same because the huge page size between Power 8 and Power 9 is different. But for Power 8, it is 16 MB and Power 9, it is 2 MB. That means my PMD level, you know, the, the, the number of entity, entities I map at the PMD level differs. And hence, my page table sizes are not same. But nevertheless, I, we have to switch them to four level because, you know, having multiple levels in the same kernel is definitely not what we want. This is the other big thing that we actually had to tackle. Uh, uh, so as I said, like, you know, hash, the, the Linux page table structure is completely software defined, uh, uh, but whereas on Power9, it's actually like, you know, a, a big Indian format. Uh, so, uh, you know, we definitely don't want to do like, you know, if Power8, in, in the page table update routines are pretty uh, performance sensitive. They, they always come in the hot path, like, you know, marking something read only, looking up the page table entries and things like that. So we don't want to put conditionals in any of those code paths. So what we decided is to switch the Power8 Linux software defined Linux page table format to begin the end. Now, the interesting thing is how do we actually make sure that it doesn't have a big performance impact on Power8? So, you know, we kind of do something interesting like, like, you know, so for example, one of the interesting things that we did is instead of converting the, the value to big Indian, we actually convert the constant to the CPU, uh, the CPU native format of the constant into big Indian. So the, the page present, the constant value is converted to the big Indian 
and then we find whether the page is present instead of doing it the other way, where I convert PTE to uh, non the NatU format and you know ending it with page present, right? So to check for whether a page present bit is set or not, there are two ways I can do. One is uh, you know read the PTE details from the memory, convert it to CPU NatU, and then do an AND operation. What we what we do essentially is we read it as it is, and the bit position, we actually convert them in the big Indian format and then add it. Uh, so th some of the interesting things that we did uh, uh, you know, to actually speed up. Uh, uh, even though I said we want to avoid the conditional code, uh, it's, in some cases it is unavoidable. Like we do have code like, you know, if radix enabled, like basically says that if you are in the new MMU model. Now, the way we actually speed this up is by using static keys, uh, uh, you know. Um, um, so why we need to do conditional, it's primarily because we have different init routines. Um, we, as I said, like, you know, guest, is, guest can now manage the TLB, whereas in Power8, the TLB is completely managed by the hypervisor. Uh, and, and we have different, uh, you know, restrictions with respect to the allocation of virtual address and things like that. So the way we actually solve this is by using static keys. So basically what we do is when we boot up the system, we actually detect whether it is power 8 and power 9, and then we go and hot patch all this conditional code in the kernel to actually do a jump rather than doing like a conditional operations and then taking the branch. The other interesting challenge that we had to do with was supporting um, 4K Linux page size. Uh, now, this, this actually throws quite a lot of interesting uh, challenge. Uh, as you see, like, you know, uh, with 4K Linux page size, we can't do transparent huge page on Power8 because our Linux page table structure is in such a way that the huge table, uh, uh, huge page size doesn't fall at the PMD level. Uh, we invent a, a, a mechanism for doing huge TLB primarily using something called huge page directory structure. That's something that we invented, which kind of made the huge page implementation slightly complex. But uh, you know, 4K THP huge page uh, implementation on Power8 is kind of like you know, uh, really challenging. But whereas 4K on Power9 is really, really simple. Now, with 4K page, Linux page says we can do transparent huge page on Power9. So, you know, yet again, a challenge of figuring out how we actually do this, you know, by making sure that, you know, when we are running on Power9, we do huge page at the PMD level, and hence we can do, uh, uh, you know, translations, and uh, hence we can do uh, THP. So, I I in summary, what we essentially have is a kernel that actually supports three translation mode. Uh, what I mean by three translation mode is that, as I said, uh, Power9 supports two translation mode, which is the hash page table structure and the radix page table structure. But the way we pick the base of the hash page table is different. We actually get that from partition table control register. Whereas on Power8, we actually pick the hash page table structure from SDR1. So we have the Power8 hash model, Power9 hash model, and Power9 radix model. All of them need to be runtime detected in the kernel. Uh, you know, we need to redo, hot patch the entire code as we boot up uh, to make sure that we actually call the right routines to update the page table entry. Uh, and, and, and all of these have to be done in a very performance sensitive manner. Now, where are we with, with, with this implementation, right? Uh, most of the code uh, required to actually run on Power9 is already upstream Linux kernel. Uh, uh, you can actually look at Linux kernel and find out, uh, you know, uh, what we did, how we did. Caught a lot of interesting bits in there. Um, the the changes to support uh, uh, KVM, that is the hypervisor, uh, you know, uh, code uh, for hash. That's the ability to run a guest in hash mode. The code to support that is uh, is already part of 4.9. The ability to run a radix guest will be upstreamed in 4.11. Uh, I think that's all I had, uh, you know, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, any, sorry, any questions at all? Thanks for the talk. Why did the pages shrink from 16 to 2, the huge pages in Power9? Yeah, so... Uh, so one of the interesting things that we wanted to do was to support 4K efficiently and do the huge page implementation efficiently. Now, uh, 
switching to a 2 MB page size kind of makes it very easy to do a huge page at the PMD level. Uh, uh, you, that, that makes it extremely easy because, uh, you know, okay, one of the interesting things that we, that we need to understand with respect to Linux page table is while we are updating this page table, we need to hold different kinds of log. And Linux kind of optimized this to death, how we actually do the page table update. Now, we have this concept called split PTL, which basically says that if I'm going to update the last level of the page table, the PTE level, the lock that I held is actually a lock stashed in the struct page of that PTE page, right? So essentially what it means is that it would be good if your PTE, map PTE page table is actually a one full page. And if you have a 4K page size and a one full page, the, the PMD, what, so one full page with each entry mapping 4K, the PMD will be 2 MB. So a 4K implementation becomes extremely simple uh, with a 2 MB page size. Now keeping the huge page size same between for, you know, 4K and 64K makes it much easier for quite a lot of operating systems implementation because we definitely don't want to say that, oh, if you are switching page size, you have to make sure your application is again tuned for huge page size, different huge page size. Now, that actually give us a little bit of challenge on the 64K side because now if you want to do split PTL, what we essentially have to do is a, a lock at 64K page. Um, you know, we kind of solve that by using something called PTE fragments. Uh, so what essentially we do is that PTE pages are fragments, you know, stolen from a 64K page. So we steal multiple PTE page from the same page and make sure that the split PTL still works for 64K. But 4K, it comes free of cost because the entire 4K is one page because my 2MB is the PMD entry and hence one page can map the 2MB entry. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Linux page size, uh, because page the... Size. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, so traditionally the bench page size of a power PC was 64K. Yeah. Is that still the case? Yeah, so I, I, I understand that question, uh, you know. So let, let, me, let me kind of clarify a few terms here. So there is something called Linux page size, which is the page size with which we build the Linux kernel, right? Config page size. That's what you get if you do get conf page size, right? So that's, that's the page size that the application uses. Uh, power architecture actually have a concept called base page size. Uh, as I said, like, you know, effective address is kind of passed into a hash function, and we get a hash value out of that. That function takes two inputs. One is the virtual eff effective address, virtual address details, and something called base page size. That's the page size with which we are actually hashing the address, right? So if, if you say my hardware only support 4K page size, 4K is the base page size. Now. To keep the discussion very simple, uh, the base page size on a hash remains 64K, but there are exceptions to that because, uh, I, I'll, I'll get to that exceptions later, the base page size remains as 64K, Linux page size remains as 64K. We don't have a concept of base page size for Radix, but we do have a concept of Linux page size for Radix, which remains 64K. Okay, uh, um. So that's why it's it a bit confusing. So, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the advantage that we have right now on PowerPC is that we can do very high speed I/O that we can't do on Intel because we have a 64K base page size in contrast to the 4K size, page size on Intel that causes a lot of uh, yeah. overhead. Is that still preserved? The, exactly. So the base page size, I think what you refer to as base page size says is the Linux page size yeah, there, okay. and that remains as 64K. Okay, great. Um, so, when you implemented the new page table format, you converted the Linux page table from a three level to a four level. Did that impose any performance penalties on Power8? We, 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 we did some measurements in the sense we ran a few benchmarks. We haven't found an impact in a way that, uh, you know, it's observable, but yeah, we will have to see. But, but I don't think we have a choice there because, yeah. you know, the other option is to switch between a three-level and four-level ta four table runtime, which would have a much bigger impact. Yeah. Fair enough. Thanks.
Thank you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned how you had to change our Power 8 support with Endel to add support for Power 9. What about what was before Power 8? Had, had you had uh, to make other changes or you don't support I the didn't, other I didn't get the question. I'm getting just. So you mentioned how you had to change Power 8 support to accommodate uh, Power 9 support. Yeah. What about was before Power 8? Was it affecting that thing in any way or? So, so the, the, the good part is that the, the part of the code that we changed is the software defined Linux page table structure, right? And we made sure that that software defined Linux page table structure will work from Power 4 onwards. So everything will work with a new format. We haven't touched embedded side at all. So the, the embedded side of the PowerPC kind of works with the old format. So I think in some platforms they use single level table, some it uses multi-level table, but those formats are not touched at all. And that's one of the reasons if you see like, you know, one of my slides before, uh, uh, you, you know, we ended up with this. So we made sure that we kind of split the headers in such a way that there is book three years, which is the server class, and there is the other headers of you know, no hash, which is basically the embedded class. And we made sure that we don't touch the embedded because uh, they kind of have their own set of optimizations and we don't want to impact those, those optimizations. So all the changes we are doing are under the book three years, and we kind of split the headers in such a way that it's much easier to make changes on the server class only. Well, uh, time is an illusion and lunchtime doubly so, but it really has happened. So if everybody could uh, thank, I'm sorry, could thank Anish for uh, that fantastic talk, that would be wonderful. Thank you.